Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And we are live on tape from Dublin. Today, we are going to talk about one song and one song only, and that song is I Want To Hold Your Hand. And, uh, you know, we've wondered if whether one song could sustain an entire podcast. And of course, it could. there's many Beatles songs we could pick apart. But we've chosen I Want to Hold Your Hand because it's in many ways a, a pivotal song. And depending on which part of the world you first experience the Beatles in, it can mean a slightly different thing to you. Um, and also, it's, it's good to talk about the early part of the Beatles career, because I, I sometimes think, Stephen, that that kind of early part of the career, we don't focus on as much as the later part of the career, because it's just busy and successful all the time. I think so. I think uh, the, the the more mature albums, uh, they have a more modern sound, uh, so, so people gravitate to those. But I think the the early songs have a a sort of an innocence about them, uh, a sort of a, a an exuberance. Um, you and I went to see Paul McCartney last year, yeah, and uh, completely unexpectedly for me, the song that that actually sort of struck uh, a chord with me was From Me To You, mm. uh, which he's doing in concert, Love Me Do. So those early songs, I think, uh, they, they just have that uh, that joy. Yes. Um, and we're certainly seeing now lots of people are writing books about the drama at the end. And that kind of seems to undermine, I think, the early years where, you know, there's still interesting things happening. I know Mark Lewison is mining these early years and giving us a level of detail that we haven't had before. But 1963 is certainly a uh, a fascinating year for the Beatles and I Want to Hold Your Hand was their fifth single. So to just have a recap of where we're at, Beatles released their debut single in October 1962, Love Me Do. They released Please Please Me in January uh, 1963, which depending on which way you look at it was either their first number one or their first number two. Um, then they released From Me To You uh, in April 1963. And then there's the double, which is their first gl- true number one. And then they have that double whammy of She Loves You coming out in August 63. And then I Want To Hold Your Hand coming out at uh, in November 63, just 14 weeks after She Loves You comes out. They release I Want To Hold Your Hand, which is kind of a something that you kind of think wouldn't happen these days. Um, and it's true to say that it is a pivotal song. I mean, particularly when you put She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand together, it's the portal through which everything changes. I think so. I think so. Uh, she Loves You, I suppose, for me, is the the, the, f- the first sort of peak of Beatlemania. Uh, certainly in the UK, that was the one that I, I, I think cemented uh, Beatlemania as a, as a social uh, phenomenon. They had, uh, as you say, the, the first three singles from Me To You was number one, but She Loves You really announced, I think, they were here to stay. And then uh, I, I Want to Hold Your Hand really just built on that. Plus, obviously, it's the, the song that broke them in America. Yeah. And I guess you look at their 1963 and, and the word that kind of summons up the whole year is kind of fast. They did an awful lot in 1963. So they recorded two albums, three standalone singles. They did 217 gigs in 1963. They had a radio show for which they were recording copious amounts of songs that many of them now feature on the Live at the BBC albums. Um, and they were becoming more successful by the week. Yeah, they, uh, they, they were on a mission. Yes. They were absolutely driven. And uh, the, 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 the work rate is phenomenal. Yeah. And they were they were ready because they, they, they kind of, you know, you, you can look back at the pre EMI pre success years and they are working hard. You mm-hmm. know, they're working hard in Hamburg. They realize what that means to come to Liverpool. When Epstein gets involved, they re- they're, they're, they're totally primed to go up this ladder throughout 1963. I think so. They had they had the work ethic yep. and uh, they were absolutely hungry for success. I mean, they, they knew they'd put the work in. They yep. could see they'd had a lot of sort of setbacks in terms of trying to get the record co- contract. Um, so they were absolutely primed and ready to do it. They had the work ethic and they were on a mission. Mm. So let's, let's, as I said, we're going to focus in on I Want to Hold Your Hand. Um, Within 1963, you know, From Me To You is released, it becomes a number one single. Um, The other thing that's happening in 1963 that is happening in parallel is obviously the Please Please Me album is coming out. And and we'll talk about that on a separate podcast some other day. But the Please Please Me album comes out, their debut album in March 1963. It goes to number one in the UK in May 1963. And what people tend to forget is that it stays at number one for an extraordinary (laughs) long period of time and basically fundamentally changes the album chart. So it stays at number one for 30 weeks 
and it's replaced at number one by With the Beatles for 21 weeks. So essentially for one solid year from May 63 to May 64, the Beatles are number one the whole time. So irrespective of the singles, they're number one on the albums chart the whole time. And all of the time that this is happening, they are number one for one solid year. Um, and then these singles are standalone singles. So From Me To You comes out a month after the album. It's not on the album. She Loves You comes out and it is uh, not on the album. And if we look at why they come to write I Want To Hold Your Hand, when they're writing that and putting that together, She Loves You is number one, the album is number one, and they are, this kind of phrase of Beatlemania is, is coming in. Yeah, and this, this is the point at which their focus has very much, uh, I, I think Epstein's focus has turned to America. So for all of the success in, in, in the UK and in, in, in Europe, um, success in, in America, just that, that breakthrough into the upper reaches of the American charts, getting capital in America to uh, pay attention to what they were they were doing. Um, so their sites are turning to, this is the next big market. This is, the, they, they were very conscious that UK artists do not do well or did not do well at that stage yeah. uh, in, in, in the States. And that was the next um, step. And I'm always interested because there's this notion that, you know, 1963, as I like to point out, is what Billy Joel calls British Beatlemania in yeah. We Didn't Start the Fire. Uh, and then 1964 is kind of seen as the American year. But there is a version of uh, the Beatles that exists in 1963 USA. So if I'm right, their records are being released by EMI in Canada to yeah. very low sales numbers, but they are coming yeah. out in North America and Canada. And the singles aren't being released in um, in the US. They're just not coming out through Capital. Yeah. And uh, so the the numbers I have here is that Please Please Me comes out on the VJ label, which is based in Indiana. They re- that sells about 7,000 copies. But From Me To You is a moderate success. That comes out in May in the US. It sells 22,000 copies and it hovers just outside the top 100. So there are kids in the USA buying Beatles singles in 1963 and there are small labels who are trying to push the Beatles in 1963. Yes, and I think it's worth r- reminding people that, that these singles are coming out on these labels because Capital yes. had rejected them. Yes. Uh, they had first refusal, effectively. They said, no, it's not going to play. So these smaller regional labels um, picked up the slack. And it's an odd, I guess this was the frustration of the dynamic between EMI and Capital, because EMI, the parent company in the UK, owns Capital. It's, yeah. it's not the other way around that Capital owns EMI. EMI had bought Capital years before. It was one of the things that Joseph Lockwood did as the head of EMI to try and he saw that the future was in like record sales that was going to be a big thing so he tried to look at making an international purchase and one of the things they did was own capital but amazingly capital in a sort of belligerent way wasn't going to be told what to do even though they were owned outright by EMI yeah I think one of the points we we talked on the books episode about uh, um, uh, Jonathan Gould's book Can't Buy Me Love and he he uses a phrase that uh, capital was institutionally biased against rock and roll uh, this was not a label uh, that that, uh, that had any regard for rock and roll. This was this was a passing fade phase. Um, anything with that kind of uh, rock and roll drum beat, they really uh, were were not inclined. Uh, they didn't favour that. Mm. And then after that, you know, she loves you comes out on a separate label, Swan, in September '63 in the US. That only sells a thousand copies, but there's obviously. A couple of thousand Beatles singles floating around the US. There's some very smug US teenagers in 1964 who were into <laughs> them in the early, who liked their early stuff. Um, but the USA is playing on their mind because the, the amount of success that they're getting in the UK is incredible. So She Loves You turns out to be the biggest selling single of the 60s eventually. And it's on its way to selling a million singles in the UK when they are trying to write and record uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. So that's kind of an unignorable figure Mm. and an unignorable success. Um, So I Want to Hold Your Hand was written in uh, what's called Eyeball to Eyeball, both by Lennon and McCartney together. So sometimes they wrote separately, sometimes they wrote apart, but this is the early period. They're writing Eyeball to Eyeball and it's written uh, in Jane Asher's parents' house. It's probably worth talking about that change in Paul's life in summer 63 when the Ashers come into the situation. So this is a point at which he, he's he's met. He started going out with Jane Asher, mm. and uh, they meet in April '63. And, and then he moves into uh, the attic, I think, mm. uh, of uh, 
57 Wimpole Street, which is the Asher family home. There are a couple of things that happen in the Beatles stories that we take for granted. Uh, but actually, when you stop and look at them, you think, that's really odd. One of them I always think is, why does the cavern have gigs on at lunchtime? That's <laughs> kind of odd. I don't <clears throat> know of that happening. But another one is, who is going out with, like in 1963, what girlfriend says, come live with me and my parents in my house? We've known each other for a few weeks. That he, just uh, doesn't seem... Uh, no, it seems very, seems, seems very forward thinking, very modern of yes. the Ashers to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to facilitate that. So you could kind of think like, it's still early days for the Beatles at this point. Paul McCartney isn't totally Paul McCartney. So, so you're saying the Ashers aren't motivated by, he's a millionaire, we should let him move in. Well, there's, there's a part of that. There's the, the, he still hasn't become who he has become, mm. essentially, so to speak. And the Ashers, you could argue, play a little part in that because, uh, you know, Paul has retrospectively, he doesn't talk an awful lot about Jane Asher in the anthology book. He says, I don't really want to say no. anything. And she has never gone on record no. of them going out for five years and, and what that meant. But he has talked about the parents and how they were kind of cosmopolitan. And this is his foothold into uh, in his foot in the door into London, so to speak. Yeah, and he sees culture. He's, yes. he, he, and he's yes, he, he had those aspirations, I think, as yeah. the, the grammar school boy yes. bettering himself and furthering his education. But it's the thing that kind of comes up with Paul again and again is that this kind of self-created myth, you know, the story of I imagined I was a poet and so I started yeah. writing songs and then, well, I just he seems to sort of say, well, I'll, I'll go into this box here and I will live this kind of London life. But he's living in the Asher's house. And so that transplants his Liverpool home where he had written famously he tells the story of he wrote She Loves You in his dad's house mm. and he comes out and plays it to his dad and he tells that story <sighs> anyway we'll scoot the, the yeah 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 yes 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 story yeah. but here we are th- about two or three months later and he's living in the Ashers in, in, in London and people kind of conflict about whether they were told to write a hit for the US and I think it's it was on their mind but I don't think it was their reason for writing the song no I think I, I, th- that that is a, a commonly held belief that they specifically tailored this song to to, to break the US market. George Martin certainly in his autobiography, which is an odd book. It, mm. it, it, What's it, that called? It's All You Need Is Ears. <sighs> <laughs> uh, it's um, he certainly doesn't have that recollection. This was just the next single. Certainly Epstein had been, you know, really pushing, really pitching um, the next release for Capital, but uh, I, I think that is a myth uh, that yeah. they, they were tailoring it specifically for American ears. I yes. don't think that's... Yeah, I think it was, well, if it works in America, happy days. Yeah. It's, it's on our to-do list, but yeah. it wasn't particularly, we've got to get to number one in America. And even, you know, towards the end of his his, um, his life, John, in his interview in September 1980, mm. gives a very clear description of writing the song Eyeball to Eyeball. And, uh, you know, it's possible that... I want to hold your hand came off the back of them just using placeholder lyrics because they'd just written I want to be your man. And, yep. you know, lyrically, the song, y- you could say, is very straightforward, you know? Yes, it's very, I mean, it, 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 in one sense, it's, for me, it's a, a slight step back lyrically from She Loves You. She Loves You is slightly more sophisticated mm. because that's the kind of she told me. Yeah, that whole third person uh, angle. That whole third person angle. So this is just sort of back to very simplistic Pride can hurt you too. That's a good lyric, That's and good, she loves yeah. you. You know, it's it's quite thought out. Um, but so I think this is a little bit of a step back. Um, th- there is a uh, Billy J. Kramer mm-hmm. uh, does say that he remembers hearing little snippets of this song in the in the, the weeks before yeah. it was finally written. Uh, and Kenny so Lynch heard it on a tour bus as yeah, well. Yeah, and, 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 and mocked and, them. And and uh, Billy J. Kramer saying, "Can I can I have that song? You know, <laughs> could, 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 could I?" And Lennon was very clear at that point. No, no. This is this is we're writing that this for ourselves. We're going to do it. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't a, It was maybe a song that they that they regarded highly, or, or you know, they gave away a lot of songs around that time. Yeah. Um, but they were very definite. This is a song that they're going to record. But I think lyrically, it is a little bit of a step back. It's more interesting musically, I think, than lyrically. Yeah, musically, and in terms of the recording of it, which we'll talk about in a sec, and also the the kind of it's it's a song that. Uh, you get the sense of the the kind of force of personality of them behind mm. the song. You know, it's a song that you know their delivery of it is part of the, the construction or the writing of the song itself. I, th- I I think so. I mean, the other thing is this is written on a piano. I think, That's or at least yeah, it's yeah. finished at a piano. Um, John talks about Paul finding that chord. Oh yeah, I that yeah. chord there, is and the, and that's the one. So this this is this is. Jane Asher's mother's piano in her music room, mm-hmm. uh, where she she was a music teacher. One of her pupils being. George Martin. George Martin. Yes. It's another one of those weird 
coincidence is that but, years before... But a coincidence that wasn't recognised, I don't think, at the time particularly? It's kind no, of later I in life. I, I, I never... No, I never have heard George Martin comment on the fact that he took music lessons from Jane Asher's Back mother. in the 40s, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, after he came out of the army or the RAF. Um, so again, it's just one of those weird coincidences mm. that crop up all the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so they write this song and as I said, you know, possibly the original placeholder lyrics were I Want to Be Your Man. I've written out a list. There's actually a bunch of Beatle want songs. <laughs> if you come chronological order, it goes, I want to be your man. I want to hold your hand. I want to tell you, and then I want you, she's so heavy. They kind of almost tell a story, those four songs across the Beatles years. Well, I don't we, think we, they're a quadrology, but we, you could we, look at it that way. We've got, you could look at it that way. Yeah, we could. If, if, <laughs> if, you were a, if you were the sort of person that's obsessed with lists, then yes. uh, yeah, nothing, well done. There's, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with a good list. No. So the song is, um, is written, not, uh, we're not sure of the exact date, but we think it's about early October that it's kind of finalised. Uh, during a little bit of downtime before they go and record it. And um, so, as I said, She Loves You is number one in the charts. They write this song, which She Loves You, number one in the charts, and they record it on a Thursday. Not the most rock and roll of days, but they record it on Thursday, the 17th of October in Abbey Road. And it's a different type of recording than before. Yes, this is the first uh, recording with a four-track Mm. Uh, uh, four track equipment uh, up to the, the this point it had been two track yeah so basically that if you know the, the four track means that they can record four separate instruments and then mix them together and four track is basically what they would stay on until post pepper really it's only yeah. towards the white album that they get towards working on eight tracks even yeah. though you know, eight and sixteen track studios became existent in the mid to late sixties. So if you if you if you break down the four tracks, there's bass and drums mm -hmm. on the first track, vocals on the second track. John and George with their guitars on the third track, and then the fourth track is held for hand claps, overdubs, backing vocals, that type of thing. Yeah, and it's uh, it was recorded. There was they were in Abbey Road Studio Two as normal. They had two sessions booked: two thirty to five thirty and uh, seven p.m. to ten p.m. And you know, even getting "I Want to Hold Your Hand" down on one day would be a good day's work. But they actually. Uh, managed to record a bunch of other things that day. They recorded a further take on uh, You Really Got a Hold on Me, the Smokey Robinson song. They recorded, the first thing they recorded that day was the Beatles Christmas fan club record, which yeah. was their first uh, Beatles f Christmas fan club record. And then, uh, after recording 17 takes of I Want to Hold Your Hand, they did the B-side, which was uh, 15 takes and two overdubs to get this boy done. That's not too shabby. Not bad. Um, now, apparently, you know, I want to hold your hand. It turns up into the studio. It's reasonably fully formed. They kind of change the middle section a little bit. They sort out the, the tempo or the, the pace of that. But it's it's uh, it, it's it's generally it's ready to go. It's pretty fully formed. Uh, I think George Martin says that he came up with the double hand claps that okay. he suggested that. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, it was pretty much as written. Yeah. Um, and so with that done, it's obviously earmarked at the time as being the next single because the other thing that they've been trying to wrap up at that time is the With the Beatles album mm. so that's their second album which is due out on the 22nd of November or it eventually comes out on the 22nd of November in the UK um, so they had been in the recording studio on and off on intermittent days off since July of 63 trying to record the 14 tracks for with the Beatles but it's there's never any indication that any of the songs being recorded for with the Beatles are being flagged as a single I find that interesting that you know no no this is the album and we're going to have a fixed thing as the single that seems to be that right from the early days that seems to have been very much the the the, the intention the ambition was to have standalone singles yeah um, different with the first two singles in the album uh, that was them starting off the singles or the launch pad uh, but but yeah, going forward, standalone singles seem to be the order of the day. Yeah, so it's uh, and it's interesting, you know, in terms of the 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 charts. You know, we've talked about you know she loves you being at number one, but there is kind of a, a huge sea change in the charts, both the singles and the album charts in the UK in '63. So up until April 1963, you know, the previous most of the uh, I've written it down here six of the previous seven number ones before the kind of the, the Beatle invasion number one have all been some variant of Cliff in the Shadows similarly in the album charts as well and uh, the other one being Frank Ifield and then if you look at the official charts the one that kind of goes down in history Jerry mm. and the Pacemakers get to number one before the Beatles yep. um, uh, so they get to number one with um, How Do You Do It the rejected Beatles song and then From Me To You gets to number one and then Jerry comes back to number one with, with I Like I It, like it mm. Um, and then towards the end of the year, 
you kind of get to get that sense of the Beatles taking over because Billy J. Kramer gets to number one with a Lennon McCartney song. And that kind of sets them apart from these other bands, you know, that, you know, they're not only the Beatles, but they're giving away these giving songs, away songs to yeah. other people. So uh, Bad To Me gets to number one. She Loves You gets to number one. And it gets to number one on two separate occasions. And we have the Royal Variety performance in the middle of all of this as well, which I guess that's what's described as the tipping point for Beatlemania in the UK. Yeah, I think that's the point at which it, it, it really breaks through to the wider public. Yeah. You know, the mums, the dads watching on TV suddenly... This is this is in their living room. Yes, and it's it's a mixture of Sunday Night at the Palladium and the Royal Variety performance. Yep. That kind of I think it's a week or two in between yep, those yep, two yep. shows, where they you know the police are called, they're outside the venue, people are screaming, people are going crazy, and what we might mention is in the background is that people on the far side of the Atlantic are starting to this is starting to permeate their consciousness. Yes, I think I think that's right. I mean, uh, you, you know, America I think generally wasn't taking much. At Paying much attention to what was happening in 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 the UK, there was a little bit um, of, of a sort of anglophile uh, feeling on the east coast of America. So you had you, you know Broadway, for example, in, mm-hmm. in 1962, Broadway shows about half of the Broadway shows in 62 had originated in the West End. Okay. So Beyond the Fringe, for example, was 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 there. Yeah. Um, the big thing in cinema was uh, Doctor No. Mm-hmm. in 1962. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there was a little bit of momentum gathering. Everyone sort of thinks the English or the British arrived with the Beatles. No. But actually, there was a sort of a slow build, but it was quite isolated but and, and it, not in music. Not and it's either. worth mentioning that when you talk about Broadway there, that, uh, you know, the TV show coming from Broadway is Ed Sullivan. And Ed Sullivan would mm. regularly feature these kind of, that was kind of an Anglophile show yes, as well, that yes. he would feature Broadway acts. I certainly know Morecambe and Wise were on there before the Beatles and a few other, like he would, he, he would have an eye on English culture as it would apply to American culture yep. and how it, how it would be um, how it would be viewed. Um, so she loves you. Gets to number one in the UK in September '63 for four weeks. Goes off the number one spot for seven weeks and then returns to number one uh, with in in November with this kind of craze of Beatlemania and it goes on the way to selling a million copies, which is hugely a hugely unusually yep. large <laughs> number yes. for the time yes. and uh, for for a country the size of, of Britain and. Um, uh, eventually, you know, uh, she loves you. Or sorry, I want to hold your hand. Comes out on the 29th of November, 1963, and it's 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 to say it's hotly anticipated is uh, an understatement. Yes, I mean it. It gets the number one essentially on the basis of pre-sales, yeah, pre-orders, and it's the first single to go past a million in pre-orders. Yeah. So even before it hits the shops, there's yeah. a million copies coming out to be pressed, and so they become the first band to replace themselves at number one. So she loves you is on the second run at number one. I want to hold your hand has a million in pre-sales, and it kind of comes in, crashes in, and pushes. Uh, actually, it takes a week to push. She loves you off, off the, the top charts, of the charts. Yeah. So there's these pre-orders, but she loves you. Hold on for one more week, and then um, I want to hold your hand comes in at number one, and then similarly. In the album charts, you know, this notion of um, the With the Beatles comes out on the 22nd, and mm. that's a great album, you know, with Any Time at All and All My Love and all those great songs are all on that. And um, then one week later, you have this totally separate single, totally brand new B-side. So you go into December 1963, and it doesn't get any bigger. They're number one and two on the singles charts. They're number one and two on the album's charts. I Want to Hold Your Hand is this, you know, spearheading this huge, huge phenomenon. Um, but then we get back onto this question of, well, then, how does the song capture capital in the US? And this is a this is a tricky one to try and nail down exactly where the where the uh, where the decision was made. But certainly Epstein was very conscious that they needed to get some kind of breakthrough song in the US. And he as soon as he hears I want to hold your hand, he thinks that this is it. So yeah. he starts making personal visits to the U.S. Isn't that right? That's right. I mean, this is this is the way their early career progressed. It, it was it was very focused on we've we've hit this step, so the next step is this, and then the next step will be this. So they they, they have a if not a worked out plan. They they you can see the stages that they're going through, and uh, you know Epstein has this sort of very focused singular vision. Uh, about the U.S. being the next step. So, yeah, he's over there. I, I think either he takes a, a copy or an acetate of, of the single, um, maybe a demo, but I think it was the finished uh, single, and he's he's there um, 
uh, trying to make this pitch to capital. Yeah, he, he goes over, um, he visits capital with an acetate in uh, November 1963. So he has a he has this recording of I Want to Hold Your Hand. Some people say, oh, he goes over with the demo, but that doesn't seem to be true. He seems no, to go I over with an acetate yeah. of the studio recording. And he talks to this chap called Brown Meggs, who is the director of Eastern Operations in Capital and meets him in, in New York and plays him this single. And that seems to be a key meeting in trying to Capital once and for all not saying we're passing on this to one yeah. of these smaller labels that, and they make a plan then that the <coughs> single will come out in the middle of January 1964 the 13th of January 1964 and you, you kind of look at it I mean it, it's, it's, it's inevitable really it's hard to, for capital to ignore million selling singles in a, in, a, in a you know they must have been doing the maths if it's selling I, a million there I, I think so and I mean uh, again Jonathan Gould he, he refers to the fact that in the uh, first of December, mm-hmm. uh, the New York Times magazine has a little story about the UK succumbing to Beatlemania. And yeah. The next week, Variety uh, it, it announces the makes the the uh, public in, in the states that it has sold a million copies mm. um, in the UK. And uh, so they obviously they're thinking, well, if we can say if, if it sells a million in the UK, much smaller population, the only uh, single to sell a million in the US was I'm going to guess an Elvis thing. Correct. It was Hound Dog backed with Don't Be Cruel. Gosh. OK. All right. So uh, Capital are looking at that and thinking, well, if we can sell a million in the UK, yeah. how many can we sell? Acast recommends podcasts we love. Hi, Fanula J here. This time, we're getting hooked on the Virgin Media Dublin International Film Festival. Each week on the podcast, we'll be delving into the films you need to know about from this year's festival. Plus, we'll be chatting to special guests like Colin Firth and Stanley Tucci. As soon as I rap on a movie, I I immediately feel unemployed. So join me, Fanula J, for Hooked On, the Virgin Media Dublin International Film Festival, wherever you get your podcasts. Acast powers the world's best podcasts, including the Irish History Podcast, The Two Johnnies, and the one you're listening to right now. In the States. So that, that, that sort of, if you like, independent third party verification of what Epstein has been telling them yes. suddenly arrives. Um, and Gould describes uh, as a sort of in-house Beatlemania striking yeah. capital with, within a matter of days. It does happen very fast. We'll, com- we'll, we'll go through the kind of the, the, the weeks in a second. But I mean, it's it, it is. I mean, it, the scale must have gone from, you know, well, what have we got to lose versus we could be making a killing on this? Yeah. Like and, and somewhere in between that, why not release these records? Yeah. And, you know, what what you mentioned there is true that the, the phenomenon itself was getting news capture in the US so there was you know people talk about Ed Sullivan being the first appearance but that's not strictly speaking no. true uh, you know in late 63 they'd been featured on CBS News with Walter Cron- Cronkite they'd featured on this thing called the Huntley Brinkley News Report on NBC and these were reports about the phenomenon themselves and the Huntley Brinkley Report the, the audio exists the video doesn't exist anymore but you can go onto YouTube and you, you hear this little five minute report of this is what's happening in the UK and this is what people are going crazy for and it's very Sneery, and it's very yeah. Th- and they, they, but they. What's interesting is they, they, they talk about Liverpool. They talk about the Mersey River, and they talk about you know how you know music is very popular in Liverpool, and they have this awful pun of you know the the the, the quality of Mersey isn't strained, <laughs> and the, the music is Merseyful, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's uh, but yeah, the phenomenon is news in and of itself. So yeah. it's certainly getting capture and. One of the fun things you can do in this day and age is pull down uh, copies of Billboard magazine from the Internet from 1963 and 1964 and try and pierce together, um, put together how they are reporting the Beatles in real time. And for for one thing that you notice is happening is that uh, uh, Billboard has a page near the back which features the charts of the world. So it has UK, Australia, you know, Europe, Ireland, all the rest. And, you know, even if you were, you know, scanning through that magazine in 1963 for another purpose uh, you must have seen on that page week on week the Beatles being mentioned more and more and more because you know they are going across Europe in 1963 they're starting to hit in Australia and New Zealand yep. they have a very strong sales in uh, you know uh, Christmas 1963 in Australia so Billboard is 
certainly reporting some of the facts. So people would have known who they were by the second half of 1963 in, in the US. It must have started to become a, a common knowledge. Yeah, uh, so, so it becomes uh, irresistible to yeah. capital that they, they, they're, they're going to have to do this. Um, but then suddenly a million sales. Yes. So uh, they, they sort of throw themselves into this heart and soul. And uh, Epstein, I think, comes up with a figure of $40,000 as an advertising yeah, campaign, and um, I mean, I remember years ago I could never really understand how the Beatles went from not really being known in the states to suddenly, uh, you know, there are girls at the airport when they arrived. They yeah. had a number one single. How did that happen? When nobody knew who they were, but it's this very fast. Yes. Lead in. I mean, a matter of a couple of weeks. So you, you Capital decide to release the single. They decide to release it in January 64 is the proposed yeah. uh, release date. Epstein has, has secured a $40,000 uh, advertising yeah. budget. Uh, they've got half a million um, uh, stickers, little, uh, you know, the Beatles Beatles. are coming yep. stickers. So they really suddenly after after a year or more of just ignoring uh, uh, the band and Epstein, suddenly they're f- fully in on board. And there's a couple of external factors which we'll talk about in a sec, but it does, as we say, happen fast. This song doesn't really exist on the 1st of October. Yeah. It's recorded on the 17th of October. Epstein is in there roughly the first week in November to Capital saying, come on, let's do this. Capital see what's happening in the UK and they say, OK, let's do this. So it seems by mid-November, Capital have said, OK, we'll release this in two months' time. And there's a couple of other external factors in terms of they start to look at dates with Sid Bernstein yep. um, for February. And then also, aside from all these other news reports, the other person who notices what's going on on a trip to the UK is Ed Sullivan. Yeah. And I think sometimes in retrospect, we think, well, you know, Paul and co, they put this thing where they say, oh, we only wanted to go to the US if we were at number one. But that's not true. In mid-November, they were going to the US no matter what. Yeah, Bernstein had had signed them up Yes, uh, to play at Carnegie Hall. Mm. And uh, th- the story is initially he contacts uh, uh, Epstein, who's back in, 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 in the UK. Epstein really not, he doesn't know who Bernstein is. Not, and then he mentions Carnegie Hall. Yeah, and that appeals to Epstein. That 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 appeals to his sort of uh, yeah. how do you get to Carnegie, you get Hall? To Carnegie <laughs> Hall? You know, that's that's the place to go. So, um, uh, Bernstein is also having to convince Carnegie Hall to put yeah. this on. They they don't want rock bands, and uh, again, he sells it to them apparently by saying this would be very good uh, uh, sort of for international relations. Yes, uh, which was the kind of buzzword of the time, uh, building up this this uh, uh, relationship between the US and the UK. So he, he sells that and then he sells that to Epstein. So they're already going. I mean, as you say, it's booked. It's 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 done. Yeah, they're, 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 they've kind of earmarked 1964 as the year to to do things in America. Yeah. And, yeah. and so there's no guarantee that they're going to have this huge success, but it does build and build. Uh, you know, there's one other external mm-hmm. factor is that uh, this Washington DJ who starts playing the single before it gets released. So the story of that is... Uh, he gets a single from a BOAC air hostess and yep. starts playing it in Washington uh, on, the, on a station called WWDC. And there's a fan involved as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a fan called Marsha Albert. Um, and uh, she, she gets in touch and saying, you know, um, uh, she, she wants to hear this. Uh, she wants to hear them. She thinks they could be, she could be big. So she gets in touch with this, uh, with this DJ. And uh, uh, Carol James was was his name, and uh, he gets the uh, the single. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's Marsha Albert persuades him to get the single. So yeah. that's the sequencing of that. Uh, he gets the single, and then he gets in touch with Marsha Albert and says, "If you can get to the station, <laughs> you can introduce." Uh, this record on the air. Yeah. So she kind of runs down to the station and she gets to introduce uh, uh, the first uh, playing of this on, I, on American radio. And I don't think it was a rock and roll station per se, but he keeps playing it like on the hour kind of thing and uh, you know putting his name over it so other stations don't steal it and it gets yeah. a bit of traction. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and Capital at that point, because this is, a, uh, this is a copy of the UK single he's playing, this is well ahead of the release date. They don't want him doing this. They threaten him with legal action. They say we're going to we're going to sue you. We're going to mm. get an injunction. Then suddenly they realise this this single has got traction. Um, 
uh, other stations are picking it up. Yeah. Uh, so they decide, right, we 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 can harness this uh, publicity. So they drop the legal action <laughs> and, and they they kind of run with it. Yes, and it's you know as you said there the you know the, the things kind of start to take up a, a momentum of themselves. And if you kind of go through the the copies of Billboard week on week, the story in the December 28th, 1963, which I think would have come out Mm. just before Christmas, you know, has its first kind of proper Beatles story where it says uh, Beatlemania appears to have taken off in the the States. The publicity ruckus stirred up so far is of major proportions. And it talks about the WWDC um, uh, DJ story and that demand has spread from Washington. So this isn't a retrospective thing. This is being reported as news that this Washington DJ DJ is is um, is making this happen. And this article at the end of December 63 talks about how they're due to be on Ed Sullivan in February. And they're also due to be featured on the Jack Parr show, which is one of these late night talk shows uh, on January the 3rd. So, the you know, and this is a small piece. This is probably the the last time that the Beatles feature inside Inside the paper, (laughs) as opposed to on the the front page of the paper. Now, the, the elephant in the room that we haven't mentioned that often gets mentioned when it talks about the Beatles breaking in the US is um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Yeah. And uh, on the day that, uh, on the 22nd of November 1963, uh, was when the assassination took place. That's the day that With the Beatles comes out in the UK. And it's often told, and it's kind of think it features in the Beatles anthology and all the stuff, that, uh, you know, part of this happened, uh, part of this success happened because people were looking for something yeah. joyful after this horrific uh, you know, nation scarring event, and uh, some truth in that. I think so. The, again, I keep going back to the to "Can't Buy Me Love" by Jonathan Gold, but he he has quite a lengthy section on this, and he looks at sort of social studies about the impact of the assassination, um, particularly on different groups, particularly on teenagers, and um, he he very much subscribes to the view that uh, the assassination hit the sort of under 20s and the teenagers hardest, that they felt the sense of loss, that they had more invested in in this young, uh, vibrant presidency than perhaps their parents or their their grandparents. And that the studies show that maybe six, 10, 12 months after the assassination, they're still almost in a state of disbelief that this this had happened. And uh, he he uses the phrase that the, the, the tenor of American life had changed post Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that he he uh, focuses on is television, and the fact that uh, the Kennedy assassination was the really the first sort of mass media news event. Yes, um, all around the world, but obviously particularly in America, where people were just glued to their television screens uh, during those first sort of hours after the shots were fired, to the mm. to the announcement that he had died, to the funeral, to the to, to the to the uh, uh, the start of the, the the Johnson presidency, the television became central. Yes, and he makes the point that the uh, biggest um, the the Beatles were watched by you know a huge number of people on the Ed Sullivan Show, and he makes the point that the only larger television audience had been on the day of the assassination. Right. So those were the two biggest television events. So it, 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 it's a sort of coming together of all those different factors. Yeah, it's certainly an ingredient of what was happening in that culture at the time that it might have fueled them. But what's important to point out is that the Beatles were on their way to America anyway. anyway. This, was, this didn't happen as a reaction to no. this horrible event. And, you know, I, I suppose it's always difficult to get into, you know, what ifs. But, um, you know, if the Kennedy assassination hadn't happened, you know, the Beatles were going to release a record. They were going to be successful anyway, weren't they? Yeah, I, I, I think it, I, I think that's indis- undeniable. I think possibly what you could say is it would have been a slower burn. It might Maybe, have taken, yeah. it might have taken longer. Um, but certainly that uh, that 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 first big uh, impetus from from uh, this single, "I Want to Hold Your Hand," that's what catapulted them. Yeah. Uh, on to television. That's what really, and uh, you know, America was receptive. I think yeah. there is uh, probably I I would buy into that. Yeah. Uh, America was ready for something. But also, <laughs> the Beatles were great. Why? W- like they'd already spent a ye- you know years. Mm. First of all, in, in Germany and in Liverpool, yeah. and then across Britain, where people who see them like them, and people who hear them love them. And you know, why shouldn't that exist in other places? I think the trick. 
uh, is is getting that exposure, is yeah. getting getting yourself in front of the audience that you want to impress. Yeah. Um, and and that was the big hurdle. Yes. Uh, so you know, if they had appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show without any pre-publicity, and they would just you know they would just be another novelty act, they'd yeah. be, be like uh, you know the cast of Oliver or <laughs> somebody with his puppets or yes. a dancing Topo dog, or, yeah, or a dancing <laughs> dog from Russia. Or so you know they would just have been another novelty act, and and you know the, the previous singles had done nothing. Yes, partly because they were on smaller labels, perhaps, but. Primarily, they just couldn't get in front of the audience, and and the way to get in front of the audience is television. Yeah, and um, you know Ed Sullivan was not getting those viewer numbers that he got. Yes, for that Beatles show. Yeah, but that was because Capital had had been forced into doing all of this pre-publicity. Well, what's interesting is you you kind of go back to these um, Billboard magazines week on week, and you you can kind of see in the weeks from the end of December 63 to the end of January 1964, the Beatles feature more and more. So in the, uh, you know, at the first uh, edition of 1964, there's this massive two-page advertisement spread in Billboard, the, the trade magazine, which is Meet the Beatles. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put a Twitter link up to these pictures, but it says, you know, Britain's Beatlemania has spread to America. It lists all the TV shows that they're on. They're due to be on Jack Parr. They're due to be on Ed Sullivan. Um, it says here, if I read it, among record buyers, Beatlemania has proved absolutely contagious. Over three million discs already sold in England alone. So be prepared for the kind of sales epidemic that made the Beatles the biggest selling vocal group in British history. Call your capital sales rep today. First single, I want to hold your hand. Backed with I saw her standing there and first capital album Meet the Beatles and as part of this trend as you say the singles moved from mid-January to the 26th of December 1963 so 1963 is still where it all happens it's still, the, it's still, it's still where it all happens and it, 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 it's worthwhile looking at some of the some of the statistics for sales mm. so they're saying uh, in the first three days they sold 250,000 copies in, in the first three days right um, and they're saying they were selling 10,000 copies per day in New York. Wow. You know, so I mean, it's it, it, it's it's a phenomenal uh, uh, impact that this has. Um, the other, you mentioned there, Meet, Meet the Beatles. One of the statistics uh, that I read was uh, uh, two months after that album had been released, it had shipped 3.6 million copies in the States. Right. Uh, albums did not sell in those quantities in the States. The focus was on the singles market. That yeah. was where the big sales were in yeah. terms of volume. And the Beatles' arrival and Meet the Beatles just completely shifted that. Yeah. So suddenly the focus is on album sales. Well, even in the UK, with the Beatles sold so many copies, it got onto the singles chart yeah. because they didn't separate the charts at the time. And uh, the Beatles are at the top of the singles chart and the album is coming in at the bottom yeah. because singles just sold more than albums at the time. So, yeah, it, it, it gets released in the US. Uh, it's brought forward these two weeks and it kind of explodes. Uh, it enters the chart... Uh, 10 days after its release at the start of 1964 at number 45 that was the biggest chart entry uh, of any capital single to date um, because the the US charts used to and still kind of does move a little bit differently to the UK charts in terms of records tend to to climb up Um, and then it jumps the following week to three and then jumps the following week to number one on its third week in the chart which is kind of an unprecedented chart life and at that point they've moved on to the front cover of Billboard. So if you go on to the January 18th, 1964 copy of Billboard, uh, it's it's uh, which would have come out the week before, it talks about how um, uh, the headline is British Beatles' hottest capital single ever. So they've gone from being a pariah on capital just two or three months earlier to having the hottest, biggest selling single ever on the label. Um, where it says it, it talks about how it lands at number 45 and um, you know that the New York City market alone as you said has sold 294,000 uh, copies and uh, that during its first week it had shipped 640,000 copies and and singles historically singles did not get to the top of the charts mm. that quickly no so Heartbreak Hotel uh, took three months to get to number one I, in America there was it was a slow climb yeah. generally uh, because of the regional nature of uh, airtime and local radio stations and so it, generally speaking singles took a while to kind of catch fire and, and, and get this was two three weeks yeah. suddenly it's number one and what are the Beatles doing at this time? 
You tell me what the Beatles are doing. They are, <laughs> they are, they are in Paris playing a residency. Oh yes, yes. Uh, yes. They're playing a live residency in Paris. So and, be, it, and not being well received by the French. No, but it's quite unusual that uh, you know we kind of think now that well it'd be multifaceted and they'd they'd have their boots on the ground when their yeah. single is entering the charts, and I think that bit of it probably did pay off in the end in terms of the myth making that they tend they they do land as these kind of conquering heroes. In yes, the US. there's an anticipation. Yes, yeah. that, that there's a build up to that, and then it just it becomes like in the UK it becomes news in and of itself separate to the the music but um, yeah they're in Paris they're in their hotel in Paris when they hear that they're number one in America for the first time Um, and then there's a fun little postscript to I want to hold your hand in Paris when they are asked to 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 re-record the vocal in German yes which Uh, they don't like no Uh, so George Martin has arranged a session uh, at a studio in, in Paris and the Beatles don't turn up yeah which is unlike them it's unlike them so they're they're standing in their hotel George Martin is at the studio they just point blank r- decide amongst themselves they're not going so they point blank refuse yeah. to go uh, it ends up George Martin has to drive back or come back to the hotel to get them and force them to go mm. and there's the sort of anecdotes about when he arrives they all sort of run and hide behind <laughs> curtains and behind sofas and uh, eventually, you know, he gets them in to record it on the 29th of January, 1964. And uh, it's one of the few times, if not the only time, apart from their Hamburg years where they record outside of the UK. Yes. And um, uh, it's really just a vocal session on top of the pre-existing track. And they record two songs in German. They record She Loves You, which is Sie lieb dich. Sie lieb dich. And then uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand as Come Give Me Deine Hand. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, 12 points and uh, and uh, these songs go off to the German market and I think in retrospect it might be you could say one of the last things that they capitulate to doing it, it's arguable that you know George Martin has said in retrospect yeah they really didn't need to re-record their songs in German it's nice to have them this was, yeah this was really the German Odeon label yeah. which was the, the subsidiary of EMI were saying well, the, the, these songs are, we can't sell this group unless it's a German language yeah uh, uh, vehicle um, but no it wasn't necessary it wasn't necessary and it did eventually as is as it was capital in the US once they started chopping and changing and mixing up Beatles albums Come Give Me Dine a Hand ended up <laughs> as the closing track on the Something Else album in the US which I'm sure was hugely popular at the time <laughs> I'm sure lots of kids uh, uh, enjoy that it's just teaching the, the Americans it, it paved German. the way for 99 Red Balloons many years later yeah. um, so essentially once the Beatles arrive as, uh, as conquering heroes in early February 1960 64, I Want to Hold Your Hand has done its job. It has become the the gateway single um, from UK Beatlemania to US and international Beatlemania. And, uh, you know, it has this ripple effect where people are hearing it all across the US. Yeah, and I think that one of the things to, to really to, to not lose sight of is that it's not just the record buying public uh, that, that are hearing this and listening to it and, and, and electrified by it but it's uh, American musicians Yes. so whether it's uh, Brian Wilson or Al Jardine or Bob Dylan everyone has commented uh, you, you know this is this is the song so Brian Wilson feels that he recognises something in I Want to Hold Your Hand that oh this is where the kids are going mm. um, but they don't really follow I Want to Hold Your Hand in their own style do they there isn't a no I don't think so yeah. but I think I, I, I think he he talks about uh, you know he knew this was a challenge. Yes. So he had to rise to that challenge. Now he's not going to slavishly copy what they're they're doing, but mm. he realizes uh, you know this is the competition. Yeah. Um, there was uh, no competition pr- prior to this coming from the UK. Yes. And then Dylan hears it in his different way, where he hears "I get high" famously instead yeah. of "I can't hide." Yeah. And that leads us down a totally different path. We can talk about someday, which is the Beatles and Dylan and drugs yeah. and all the rest. Yeah. Um, the other person that I, I read recently talking about it was Al Jardine. Oh, yeah. And he said the first thing that struck him was simply how loud mm-hmm. it was. Yeah. This, this didn't sound like anything that uh, he had heard before. It was incredibly loud. And then the vocals. Yeah. And he said the closest that he could c- compare it to was uh, the Everly Brothers. But the Everly Brothers didn't have weren't that loud. Yeah, didn't have uh, noise. Didn't have the noise behind him. Uh, yeah. So he was saying it was absolutely uh, game changing. Yeah. Um, that yeah, this is this is the future. And other people have spoken, obviously, like um, Springsteen and uh, Little Stephen and Billy Joel and eventually the Birds and all these people. They all see this thing happening. And I guess 
you know, in a in a less connected time, if everyone's gathered around their TV to see mm. the Ed Sullivan show and they the, the final song they performed that night is "I Want to Hold Your Hand," they open with "All Your Love," and it's. I mean, I watched that again recently, uh, and even if you if you try and strip back the kind of legendariness yeah. of it, it's a fantastic performance. It it is. I like mean, it and, and, and there's no. I certainly don't see any signs that they're nervous. No, I mean they must have been. Oh yeah. But, uh, you know, this is going out live yes. uh, to however many million. They, you know, they don't know how many people are going to be watching, but, you know they, mm. know, they know this is a big audience and this is their big shot. Yes. And they, they, it's a fantastic performance. But again, it's a performance that they've honed over years mm. and years and years. And it's, it's uh, you know, probably the, the U.S. experience of Beatlemania where they present themselves as a fully formed item it's different to the UK where there's this kind of slow gradual yeah. look at these guys look what they're doing building better and better and better and I think I think this song is probably the best song that they could have left the audience yeah. with because yeah. it's it's just it's full of little hooks yeah uh, you know it, it's got a little kind of almost a little ballad section in the middle yeah um, it's got those voices it, it doesn't have a guitar solo but the guitar is kind of featured throughout the yes. song um, you could argue that the lyrics are kind of pure, but they also have a nodding. Yeah, yeah I want to hold your hand. I don't know. Little, little, maybe a bit more. Little, little bit of a wink. Yes, uh, depending there, on how you look um, at it. And 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 it's a simple. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple lyric. Yeah. Um, it's 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 got all of the ingredients. So whilst I don't think they there's truth in the rumor that they they wrote it specifically for the American market. I, I think it's hard to think of, of a, a, of song a better that song worked that would have worked as well. And it obviously it kicks down the door to what's known then as the British Invasion. If you look at those early January 1964 billboards, there's an ominous little quarter page ad uh, that says Epic Records introduces the Mersey sound with the Liverpool beat, the Dave Clark Five glad all over. And then that kind of sets in train <laughs> a period. <laughs> I know we're not going to start a Dave Clark podcast anytime soon. Um, but it, it, it is a game changing song uh, for the charts and for how music is experienced. And, you know, once again, it's worth thinking. It comes out 14 weeks after She Loves You. You think of any epical single in our lifetimes, you take something like that, like say Smells Like Teen Spirit. You know? yeah. Imagine if that was an album that was a single non-album track that had a big change and then 14 re- weeks later they release another song with the same impact it's like impact yeah. on top of impact while the first song is at number one while the first song is at number one you know they didn't need yeah. to do that but that's what they kept doing was they just kept supplanting themselves yeah. and moving and onwards, I, I, and, onwards. I, I, and I, I do think that is the secret that that is why I think uh, you, you know the Beatles mean so much mm. in, in America yeah. uh, because of the Sullivan because of the the Kennedy assassination because of that that the, the sort of explosive nature of uh, you know uh, their impact. Yeah. Beatlemania, as you say, it took a while to build in the UK. Um, it sort of accelerated, but, but it was a it was a slow build. Yeah. In America, it just exploded. Yeah, and rightfully so. All right. Well, look, that's I want to hold your hand. At most, we hope we've uh, we're going to send you back to your seven inches or your CDs or whatever and uh, listen to I want to hold your hand and in all its explosive glory and try and imagine that it's a uh, 1960. Late 63, early 64, all over again. Uh, any other closing comments? No, I think I think we've covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Well, look, um, get in touch with us if you want to talk about uh, the song. Um, we're on uh, Facebook. Uh, there's a Nothing Is Real group, so just ask to join that, and Stephen will manage that. We're on Twitter on at Beatles Pod, and uh, we're happy to interact in all the usual places. Don't forget, uh, if you like listening to us, make sure you're subscribed and listen to all our old episodes as well. But for Nothing Is Real, I'm Jason Carty. I'm Stephen Cockcroft. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you.